Muslim leaders reject the idea that it is not possible for Jesus to bear our sin. Instead, each person can only bear their own load before God. They also point to verses in the Bible that they think teach a similar idea. Are Christians wrong to say that Jesus died for our sins? How can Jesus pay for the sins of others? Follow us as we answer the question. Welcome to this channel. If you are not already subscribed, please do and press the notification bell to be notified when a new video is uploaded. Let's get to it. In the previous episode, we see that the Quran and Hadiths teach about substitute sacrifice. In fact, Christians and Jews are supposed to be the substitute sacrifice for Muslims. That will only make sense if Christians and Jews were not sinners already. If they were already sinners and going to hell, how then can they be qualified to save Muslims from going to hell? In this episode, we will address the question, how can Jesus die for the sins of others by considering what the Bible teach? Christians believe in all of the prophets and make no distinction between them. What Christians believe about Jesus comes from all of these books and writings of the prophets. Let's now consider how these books prepare us for the death of Jesus and explain his death to us. The first way they teach us about the death of Jesus is by teaching about sacrifice. First, let's consider the substitute sacrifice. Beginning with Abraham. God commanded Abraham to offer his son as a sacrifice. Abraham obeyed God and just as he was about to kill his son, God sent his angel who provided Abraham with a ram. This ram was a substitute sacrifice in the place of Abraham's son. The ram represented Abraham's son and died in his place. The angel said, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Genesis 22:14. Thus, God provided a substitute sacrifice to save Abraham's son from death. God provides. Next, let's take a look at the Passover. In the Law of Moses, we read how the Israelites were delivered from Egypt and Pharaoh. God sent nine plagues on Egypt but they refused to let the Israelites go. The tenth plague was the death of the firstborn son. God was going to send his destroying angel to kill the firstborn son of every family in Egypt. The Israelites were saved from this destroying angel only if they sacrificed a lamb and painted its blood on the doorposts of their homes. One lamb was to represent each house and the death of this lamb would be a substitute for the death of the firstborn son of that house. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I, God, see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Exodus 12 13. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the doorframe. Not one of you shall go out the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Exodus 12 21-23 the firstborn sons of Israel were saved from the wrath of God by the substitute sacrifice of the Passover lamb. The Israelites were instructed by God to remember this event by celebrating the Passover meal once a year. The Passover sacrifice demonstrates that you can be saved from the judgment of God by a substitute sacrifice. Next, let's consider forgiveness in the Law of Moses. When somebody living under the Law of Moses sinned, they were responsible for what they had done. If they repented they could be forgiven by offering a sacrifice that would bear their sin before God. The person would place their hands on the animal's head. And the animal would then represent them. The sacrifice would then die in the place of the person who had sinned. He must bring as his offering. For the sin he committed a female goat without defect. He is to lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and slaughter it at the place of the burnt offering. Then the priest is to take some of the blood with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. He shall remove all the fat, just as the fat is removed from the fellowship offering, and the priest shall burn it on the altar as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. In this way, the priest will make atonement for him, and he will be forgiven. Leviticus 4 28-31 For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar, it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Leviticus 17 11. 
This is why a lot of the Torah teaches about priests, sacrifices and the tabernacle or temple where the sacrifices were offered. The Torah teaches individual responsibility and forgiveness through a representative sacrifice that bears our sin. Consider the Day of Atonement for a moment. In the Law of Moses, we read that after God delivered Israel from Egypt He commanded them to make a special tent. The Tabernacle. This tent was where God spoke to Moses and where the Israelites brought their sacrifices to God. However, the sin of the Israelites defiled this tent and its furniture and made it unclean. In fact, the sin of Israel made their whole nation unclean. God provided another sacrifice for the Israelites to take away their sin and uncleanness. It was the Day of Atonement. Two goats were the main sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. These sacrifices were substitutes for the sin of Israel. Here is what Aaron was instructed to do with the goats. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats. One lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement. By sending it into the desert as a scapegoat. Leviticus 167 7-10. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. Leviticus 16:15. When Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting in the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it in the desert. Leviticus 16 20-22 Both of these goats were to represent Israel. The first goat was killed as a sin offering. The second goat figuratively carried the sins of Israel far away. The law of Moses demonstrates clearly that God accepts a substitute as a sacrifice for the defilement of sin. Hundreds of years after Moses, and hundreds of years before Jesus, God spoke to the prophet Isaiah. He said that he would provide a new sacrifice like he provided for Abraham. This sacrifice would turn away God's wrath like the Passover sacrifice. This sacrifice would remove sin like the Day of Atonement. In Isaiah chapter 52 from verse 12 to chapter 53 verse 12, we read. See, my servant will act wisely, he will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man. And his form marred beyond human likeness. So will he sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep, have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Here, we see that the servant of the Lord will offer himself as a sacrifice for sin, for our sin. What amazing prophecy hundreds of years before Jesus. 
Some Muslims may claim the servant of the Lord in this prophecy is the nation of Israel and not an individual. Let's assume for once that that was the case, that does not change the fact that this prophecy is still about a substitute sacrifice for sins. But the servant of the Lord is more than the nation of Israel, it is an individual. In Isaiah 49 6 we see that the servant will be an individual who will call Israel and the nations back to God. God says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the nations, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Isaiah 49 6. In fact, the servant of the Lord is the Messiah, as seen in Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 to 3. The Messiah is described in the same way as the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 42 verses 1 to 7. Isaiah 53 is an amazing prophecy about someone who will bear the sins of others and be their representative. Hundreds of years after the prophet Isaiah, God sent the prophet John the Baptist. John lived at the time of Jesus and he spoke about Jesus. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. John 1 29-31. The prophet John calls Jesus the Lamb of God. When John says this he is referring to all the sacrifices that we have read about in the prophets. Throughout the Gospels, we read of Jesus' power to make people clean. Some were unclean from skin diseases, some unclean from bleeding and some unclean from possession but when they came into contact with Jesus they were made clean. A man with leprosy came knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was made clean. Matthew 8 2-3 Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Matthew 9 20-22 Jesus was not made unclean by these unclean people touching him as would normally happen. Instead, Jesus gave the purification of God to them. Jesus also spoke about his death and resurrection. From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised up on the third day. Matthew 16 21. Jesus said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20 28. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John 10 11. When Jesus celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples he taught them that he was the new Passover lamb. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26 17-28. This is how Jesus understood himself. He said he was the fulfillment of the previous sacrifices. He was the one who would represent others and die in their place. He was the servant of the Lord who would give his life as a sacrifice for sins. Jesus' greatest act of purification was to purify people from their sins through his death on the cross. The disciples of Jesus taught the same message. Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. 1 Peter 3 18. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2 2. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5 21. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 1 5-6. Therefore all of the prophets teach one message. They all teach a sacrifice for sin and this is what Jesus fulfilled. Dear Muslim friends, if you Imams and scholars lie to you about the Quran and the Bible, what else are they lying to you about? If you choose the God of the Jews and Christians, you must read the scriptures of the Jews and Christians to know their God. 
Thank you for joining us in this episode. If you like what we do, please endeavor to subscribe and press the notification button to get an update when the next episode is uploaded.